still, how can I remain silent? And could do with turn to clay. Shall I not lie down like him, never to move again? <clears throat> Siduri looked deep into the king's mournful eyes and carefully weighed his words. Then Gilgamesh spoke again, asking, which is the way to Ugnapishtim? What are the signs and markers if possible? Let me cross the sea, he pleaded with her. But Siduri frowned, saying, None but Shamesh crosses that sea. The crossing is hard and dangerous, for everywhere stream the waters of death. Once again, Gilgamesh repeated his lament. Oh, uh, still she went on, uh, quote, go find Urshanabi, the boatman, down by the water's edge. Anyway, she went in, unquote. So Gilgamesh left Siduri's house and climbed down to the beach. He found an old man standing by a wooden barge. It was Urshanabi who turned to Gilgamesh, asking, why do you roam the wilderness in search of a wind puff? So once again, Gilgamesh repeated his lament. The boatman, moved by this sad story, readily agreed to help him. He told the king to cut down and prepare poles from the forest. These they loaded into the boat, and when Urshanabi cast off the mooring rope, in three days they paddled the distance usually traveled in 45, and so arrived at the waters of ultimate dismay, at the ocean of death. But Urshanabi was not at all frightened, and he showed Gilgamesh how to move the boat forward by pushing along with the pole, warning him not to touch the poisonous waters. With the boatman's encouragement, Gilgamesh went hard at it, and one by one, he wore down all the poles against the rocky sea bottom. When they were all gone, he made a sail from his and Urshanabi's clothes, and the wind filled it. Finally, they could see land ahead. It was the Garden of Paradise, the source of all rivers. There, the immortal Utnapishtim, who had seen the boat coming, was at the shore to greet them. As the barge touched land, Utnapishtim stepped forward. Gilgamesh immediately recognized him and said, My friend Engadu, the one I love dearly, has turned to dirt, so I decide to find you, the remote one about whom they tell tales. I wandered all the lands. I crossed and crossed the lands. I traveled over the sea of death. My body is filled with grief. I am worn out and have had no sleep. I killed bear, hyena, lion, panther, tiger, stag, and ibex. I ate their flesh and covered myself with their skins. I slept in dirt, in pitch black. I am the unlucky one, the faded." Unquote. The ancient man, hearing this misery, questioned Gilgamesh, quote, why are you so full of woe? You who have made, were made of the flesh of the gods and people. Do we build a house forever? Do we seal a contract for all time? Does hostility last forever between enemies? Does the river always rise higher, bring on floods? From the beginning there is no permanence, the sleeping and the dead. How like brothers they really are, the wild man and the hero. Are they not the same when they arrive at their fate? The divine judges and the mother of destiny set the end of all things. They settle the death and life. As for death, its time is hidden. The time of life is plainly shown. Unquote. Then Gilgamesh studied Utnapishtim silently for a long time. Finally, he said, your features are no different than mine. I am like you. Tell me, how did you come to stand in the assembly of the gods asking for eternal life? Replied Utnapishtim. I will uncover for you, Gilgamesh, a hidden thing. I will tell you a secret of the gods. Then he told this story. The flood. Excuse me, I've done some of my... This is Kido. This is several thousand years before the uh, Jewish story. <clears throat> several thousand years earlier. The gods in council resolved that the Lord of the air, Enlil, should send a flood to destroy all humanity. Yet, they kept their plan secret, and they took an oath not to forewarn any mortal about their plans. But then Father Enki, Lord of the Abyss, came down from heaven to the city of Shurpak and hovered behind a reed wall, a wall made of reeds. Pretending to muse out loud and talking out loud, he addressed the wall like this, quote, Read wall, wall, listen to me. Tear down the house, build an ark, abandon riches, seek life, load the seed of every living thing into your boat, unquote. And he then gave instructions for the building of a huge ship. It just so happened that a man was standing on the other side of this particular reed wall. He heard everything. This was Utnapishtim, the wise sage, Enki's disciple. 
He replied, My Lord, what you have asked I will do in praise of you, but to get the people's help I will need to explain to the city and the elders. So Enki told him to say this, quote, Enlil hates me, me, I can't live in your city or turn my face toward the land, which is Enlil's. I'll go down to the abyss to live with Enki, my lord. He will make richness rain down on you. The choicest birds, the rarest fish, the land will have its fill of harvest riches. At dawn, he'll pour showers of wheat down on you, unquote. This all involves words that involve puns, which cannot be translated, by the way. Which is why the people kind of fall for these words. They sound like one wonderful blessing, but they're all pun words and they actually mean deluge. When Udna Pishtim repeated these words to the people, they were overjoyed in anticipation of rich blessings. So they helped him enthusiastically. And in seven days, the great ark was finished. Udna Pishtim immediately took on board his family and allowed the seed of all living things. When dawn next broke, broiling black clouds, shooting streaks of lightning, surged up from the horizon, while a fierce wind and warring thunder rushed ahead, trumpeting the storm. Then thick clouds raced over all the land, and soon endless streams of rain lashed down. Even the air turned dark, and the din was overwhelming. Holding the spectacle from heaven, even the gods themselves shrank back in terror. Quote, How could I speak evil in the assembly of the gods? Unquote. Ishtar cried out in anguish. Quote, How could I demand the destruction of my people like this? Unquote. And all the gods sat weeping in heaven. For six days, and they didn't change their minds, right? For six days and seven nights, torrents raged over the land until only the ark of Udna Pishtim rested on the waters. On the seventh day, the storm grew quiet, and then the clouds scattered. Udna Pishtim opened a window and shouted for joy at the sun. After a while, an island arose from the sea, and the ark grounded on its shore. When seven more days had passed, Udna Pishtim sent off a dove, but it soon came back. Then he sent a swallow, but it too returned. Finally, he released a crow, and it circled overhead and left. Udna Pishtim gratefully offered sweet incense to the gods. Hungry for attention, they came down by ones and twos to savor the fragrant scent. Ishtar, raising an iridescent amulet before the ark, said, quote, Gods, let me not forget this. I will remember these evil days always, unquote. Uh, she paused and then continued, quote, But Enlil brought on this flood, and because of this do not let him near. He numbered my people for slaughter, unquote. Just then the Lord of the air, that's Enlil, came through the sky. When he saw the ark, he grew furious, bellowing in wrath. Has life breath escaped? No one was meant to live through this devastation. But then God, the god Enki stepped forward and addressed Enlil, You, shrewd one, bold warrior, you got us to send the flood without really talking it through. By clever argument, you tricked us to serve your end. Justice should be fair. Punish the one who commits the crime, not everyone. Punish the evildoer alone. Instead of raining on another flood, let lions and wolves rise up, let there be famine and plague. Unquote. The air god looked at Enki and realized Enki's words were wise. Walking up to Udna Pishtim and his wife Enlil touched their foreheads in blessing. Now I transform you, he said to them. Let Udna Pishtim live forever at the source of all rivers. Then the gods took Udna Pishtim and his wife to the paradise land of eternal joy in the middle of the great abyss where they lived from then on. The plant of life. After telling this story, Udna Pishtim challenged Gilgamesh to a test. Before he could gain the object of his long quest, the immortal one said, Gilgamesh must stay awake for six days and seven nights more. The king readily agreed, but even as he sat there, he fell asleep. Then he slept for seven days solid. Each day, Udna Pishtim's wife baked another loaf of bread and put it by his head. Finally, the old man touched Gilgamesh, and he awoke. Quote, as soon as I was ready to fall asleep, said the king, you touched me and roused me, unquote. But then Udna Pishtim showed him the seven loaves. <laughs> Quote, what can I do, Udna Pishtim, cried Gilgamesh in despair. Where can I go? A thief has stolen my flesh. 
Death lives in my house. Death follows me everywhere I go. Udnapishtim listened to Gilgamesh, then turned to Urshanabi, the boatman, who was still standing nearby. Quote, no longer will you come to my shore, he told the boatman. Take Gilgamesh, cast off his filthy animal skins, wash his body, and dress his hair with fragrance. Unquote. Then said the sage, have him put on a garment, the robe of life, so that he may go back to his city, and you will go with him. Let Gilgamesh put on this elder's robe, and let it always be new. Unquote. Urshanabi did as he was told, and when he put the robe of life around the shoulders of the king, Gilgamesh's fuel, full beauty was restored to him. When the men, two men returned to the boat, Udnapishtim was there with another secret of the gods. Quote, there is a plant, he said to Gilgamesh. Its roots go deep, its bite will prick you, but if you get your hands on it, you will have everlasting life. And as he said this, the old man pointed into the ocean there, where Gilgamesh saw a deep channel. Wasting no time, he tied rocks to his feet and jumped into that water. Down he went to the very bottom of that great abyss, and looking around, he saw the sacred plant just at his feet. So he reached out his fingers and pulled it up by the roots, even though his hand was bricked. Then he cut away the stones at his feet and quickly rose quickly rose to the surface. This is the plant of life, Gilgamesh joyfully cried, bursting back into the air. I will carry it to Europe and give it to the elders to eat. Old men will be made young, and I will have some too and return to my youth, unquote. So Gilgamesh and the boatman now sailed back over the waters of death, and this time the crossing was easy. They continued together past the barmaid's white house, past the garden of gems, and through the tunnel of the sun. When they arrived at the stone gate, it was open, and they moved quickly out over the land. After many days, they came to a pool. Tired and dirty, Gilgamesh stripped off his clothes and jumped in. But the splashing water woke a snake that had been sleeping at the bottom. The snake smelled the plant of life, and while Gilgamesh bathed, it swam up silently, slithered out on the bank, and ate the plant. As it returned through the water, the serpent turned around and around, shedding its skin. When Gilgamesh came out of the pond and saw the plant was gone, he sat down by the water's edge and wept. But after a while, he got up and continued his journey. Soon enough, he arrived back at the walls of Europe. How the king found his lost soul. After the most difficult quest that anyone had ever attempted, Gilgamesh came home once again to the joyful cries of his grateful people. But now he was different, transformed by his journey. Ignoring the celebration, he went directly to his palace with Urshanabi and got out his sacred drum and beater. These instruments had been in his possession for a long time, but never before had he felt the slightest interest in them. Now he found he knew how to use them correctly, and so he picked them up with reverence. Then he started to play the drum, and as he did so, he fell into a shamanic path. This is the, the 12th tablet. He was back before Enkidu's death, standing proudly in his crown after he had returned with the head of Humbaba. Ishtar saw his heroic stature and strength, and, and so she called down. That's where it's still the same as the last version, but this is where it changes. And she asked him to help her with a vexing problem. It seems she had a special hulupu tree growing in her garden. It had been torn out of its distant native soil by the violent south wind ages ago, then washed away in the raging Euphrates, but was later found by a woman and taken to Ishtar's fruitful garden where it grew mighty under her tender care. Now the goddess wanted to cut the tree down, to make a throne and a bed for herself. But a great dragon called, quote, the snake who knows no charms, unquote, came and built a nest in the roots, and the hideous indigood bird, an eagle with the face of a lion, placed its young in the crown of the tree. The vampire Lilith also came and built a house in its trunk. Now no one could approach the tree safely. Ishtar was powerless and wept in frustration. She asked her brother Shamish to help her, but he refused. So when she saw how powerful Gilgamesh had become, she turned to him. In his vision, Gilgamesh eagerly heeded Ishtar's call. 
taking his mighty armor and axe, he went with Enkidu to the lupu tree in the garden. There they waited, and when the snake came forth, Gilgamesh swung his axe and chopped it in two.